So I, I'm deeply honored to be joined by Bert today. Bert Bernanke is based out of Chicago and he's been in the photography world for a very long time. Bert, you don't look anywhere old enough to be in the photography business for as long as you have. Whatever that cream is you're using, you know, you, you need to send a bit this way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. But you, what, I've, I've, been, I've been getting teased a little bit by my friends when it said since 1956. Well, I was, I was, I was born in 1955, so I kind of didn't start the business, as you can probably figure that out. So but, your parents started the business, was it? Yes. yes. Okay. So yeah. at what stage did you pick up a camera then? Well, you know what? It's kind of funny because I am not one of those kids that was born with a camera in my hand, and I, that's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, you know, the family story is my mother was rocking me in the little, the little seat underneath the table while she did sales as a baby. I was, I was one of those kids in strollers at conventions. Not that I remember that, but, uh, I remember going to conventions as a young person and mostly I was going cause it was fun. We were with other photographers, kids, we'd run the hallways and we'd swim in the pool and we'd watch our parents talk shop, but we were just kids. Um, I started working in the studio probably about 10 years old, sweeping the floor. You know, and, and to this day, I'm still the vice president in charge of garbage at my company. <laughs> so C Cindy's the real boss, is she? Cindy is the, she <laughs> is the real boss. And you know why? Because <laughs> it, it makes it better for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I know the feeling. My, my wife, Susan, who you've met as well when you were over here. You know, she, she's, she's the real boss too, you know, I just, I just pretend to be the boss, but, you know. Well, like, like I was saying, we just, we, we just do all the, we're the people, I'm the people person. I'm the one, uh, Cindy actually does probably 70% of the photography in the studio, maybe more. Um, but still, because I grew up in this area, in the little town, where I'm about 35 miles outside of Chicago. They still look at me as the face of the studio because of being around here all my life. I grew up here, Cindy grew up in Southern Illinois, but she's been here 30, almost 30 years. Um, so it's, 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 it's an interesting thing to do. She does, like I said, she does all the hard work. I'm just the pretty face. I just show up, which is a, which is a lie, right? <laughs> so, so tell me then, did, did you ever want to be something other than a photographer or did you always end up wanting to be a photographer when you were, when you were seeing, you know, your, your family in the business and stuff like that? I thought I didn't want to be, I never knew I wanted to be a photographer. I mean, I go, going through high school, I did not work on the school yearbook. I didn't pick up the cameras. I had a camera. I took pictures. I had a 35 millimeter camera. I did lots of fun pictures, but I just thought the family business was there and I was going to do something else. I went to college to become a, an accountant. I was a business, a double major business in accounting. And I went to college for four years, but I didn't graduate because every year I was working full time in my parents' studio. Um, and after high school, I got engaged my, the year after high school to my high school sweetheart. So as I was going through college, I was getting pulled between relationship, work, and, and, uh, and school. And after everything kind of settled out and everything like that, after four years, when normally that'd be the year I'd be graduating college, but every semester I'd drop a few classes so I could do more work or hang out and shoot pool in the student union, whatever the real truth is. And, um, and I, it just kind of, it pulled me in and, and I quit college and my mother cried and my father said, I told you so to her because he, I guess he saw it in me. I was doing weddings. You know, I was doing, they, they gave me the easy things as a photographer to do. I photographed weddings and babies. That's the only thing I photographed as young. The two things that you probably shouldn't give a kid, a young person to do. But uh, I found mm -hmm. out that I loved it. I fell in love with it. And, you know, the rest is history. In 1973, I joined PPA and never looked back. Very but good. I'm, I'm second generation in our business as well. So I think I probably understand <laughs> some of the challenges that that can be sometimes too, as well as all the good times. What was the biggest challenge for you working with your parents? Um, well, I guess the biggest challenge is well, a couple things. 
trying to figure out which one to listen to because my dad was the photographer, the creative one, and my mother was the studio owner. She, she, my, never, my mother's never taken a picture. You have time for a quick story about the two of them? Absolutely. Um, my, my parents started the studio in 1956, created a very successful studio. In the early 80s, they opened a second studio down in Florida. And for three years, I would go down there for two weeks and they'd come back for the two weeks, every six weeks. I'd be here six weeks down there, two weeks, they'd be the opposite. And they built a very successful studio down in Florida. Um, so two things happened during that time. One was, and I told my dad, I said, this town ain't big enough for the two of us anymore. I, I had, for six weeks I'd run the studio, then he'd come back and tell me that it was still his studio and I had to do it things his way. So I purchased the studio up here in 1985 um, as I was, 30 years old, that's 30 years old when I, actually 29, I think, when I bought the studio from them. And the studio had already been in existence almost 30 years. And it was a big deal for me because I was able to become my own boss. My folks loved it because they had their own studio down in Florida. Um, the negotiation when we were buying the studio before we closed, we used a family attorney who was PPA's lawyer at the same time. So he knew photography business. And before we closed that day, I asked, I said quickly, can I talk to you for a minute, Sid? And he says to me, sure. He says, what's up? I said, I'm not sure I'm giving my folks enough money. It's their business. Maybe I'm not paying enough. They're probably being nice because I'm there. Kid. And he shook his head and he laughed. He said, they talked to me five minutes ago and said, I think we're charging a kid too much money. <laughs> he says, so I think you're probably at the right point. So that was, a, that was a big thing like that. And then a couple of years later, mom and dad's marriage didn't work out. So they went their separate ways. Mom moved back to Chicago, dad stayed in Florida. Dad kept the studio. Remember I mentioned he was a photographer, not much of a businessman. My mother came to Chicago and told us she was gonna become a consultant in the photographic field. My father and I thought that was quite funny. That somebody would pay her to tell them how to run their business. Well, about three years later, my dad closed his studio because he didn't know how to run it. And my mother for the next 30 or 40 years, had a, about 30 years, had a very successful consulting business consulting for people like Eastman Kodak, the largest photo labs in the States, Art Leather, Leather Craftsman, a bunch of the big uh, album companies. So it made me realize very quickly that if I want to stay in this business, I better, I better know the business of it. Photography is my career. It's not a job. It's my career. And I want to continue to do it. Uh, so thus, I got to take care of the business, which is why I'm so appreciative of what you're doing with the Business Academy, with now, you came into a bunch of our lives, and right away, those of us that are in the business knew that Ronan was the real deal, that we could count on you to perpetuate the business part of it. Because that's, I don't care how much you like to take pictures. If you can't stay in business, you're not going to do it. Pretty pictures are pretty pictures. Business is business. So did you learn the business side from your mom, Bert, or did you learn some there, and then you could learn more in PPA, or how did you go about that? I learned, I learned basic business in college. I mean, even though I didn't graduate, I learned a whole, I use everything I learned in college to, to in my business, whether it's the finances, the, the management, which I'm not the best at, but the marketing, obviously, and how to, how to get people to come to my business. Um, but the PPA system is really where I learned all the real ways to stay in business. I was real involved in our state of Illinois chapter of the PPA which had about six, 700 members when I was involved back in the, mostly in the early eighties with that. Um, and I stayed involved until, you know, the last few years with it when they dissolved because not enough people are participating in, in the locals and the States. But honestly, and from my dad, I mostly learned, I learned the best lesson I ever learned in my life from my dad. And his was, do as I say, not as I do. Cause he had great thoughts on doing it. He just couldn't stick to his own ideas sometimes. My mom was one that could stick to things. So he was basically telling me, listen to mom on the business end of it. But I don't know how much I've, I, I, I've, I've learned most things by sitting with people like this. We might be sharing, I was going to say a beer, but if it was with you, it'd be a pint. A pint of Guinness. We've been there, right? Which we've done. But as a young person, watching my father and mother, but even my, my father liked to have the beer more than mom. Watching him with his, his other, his peers, after a hard day of conventioning, 
you know, in the lounge or having dinner over drinks, the things they discussed then were just invaluable. I mean, they were the life's lessons that the books don't teach you or the little things where they talk about their businesses that maybe it was, they would think things that you don't think are important. Like if you're listening to a program, it's usually a polished presentation. They'll give you all the basics and the important things that they want you to hear. But pay attention. If you don't walk by the bar, when you're at, if you go to a convention, walk by the bar. Even if you're not a drinker, just sit around there and over, overhear what they're talking about. Because there's a lot of good information being passed back and forth there. Could be at the swimming pool. It could be a restaurant. Could be in the back outside the program room at a convention. There's a lot of information that goes on when you least expect it. I think that's a really good point because any convention I've ever gone to, and I've gone to so many classes at different conventions, would you learn as much from the people who are attending with you in the bar or having a conversation over a sandwich or a cup of coffee, it doesn't matter what it is, just throwing those ideas against each other. And that's the really great thing about all the regional conventions, like the ones you, you've run in the, in the past and still do, and for at Imogene, right? Yeah. You know, it's, you know, being involved with imaging so much over the years, being a past president of PPA, I got a lot of opportunities to work with the staff, which had a lot of information, professionally presented information that we could digest and start to use in our own businesses. But just, I just saw somebody, David Dave popped up and he says, yeah, the bar is where you learn most of everything. You know, you learn the good things and the bad things. When they say nothing good ever happens after midnight, not true. There's a lot of good things that happen. And actually, there's a lot you learn. Some of it you learn what not to do. But there's just, you know, I have lifelong friends in this business. We're the, we're the old timers now. But I love listening to the young people now. I, 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 I laugh with them and at, the, at them sometimes at the same time. And I tell them why I'm laughing at them. Because they just get so concerned about every little thing. And it's like at a certain point you've usually experienced just about everything and you learn how to handle it. The younger generations, Bert, and I think that, and um, you know, they can learn everything on YouTube that they need to about photography. Would they miss out on what you've just described there, you know, that, that learning, that interpersonal learning. Have you any thoughts on how we can get that message through to those younger people that they need to come to these day conventions? Because you and I go to a lot of conventions now and the age profile seems to be getting older. We seem to be missing those younger people. Have you any thoughts? I know it's a, I'm looking for a silver bullet here, and there never is a silver bullet, but have you any thoughts on how we can encourage them to get involved and come to these conventions where they can sit down and have a chat and learn that way? You know, it's, I guess maybe the, the, the biggest, if, if there's a lightning thing that, that hit me, it's IPS. Right? Is that the catchword these days? All these the newer people in photography are talking about in-person sales, IPS. If you're not doing IPS, you're missing out on all this money. You're missing out on all this money. And I've never done anything else. It's always been in-person sales because you know you're if now there's all kind of different photography, but most of the people that I'm, I'm sure are on this broadcast here are people photographers, whether it's weddings, events, portraits, whatever it is like that. Um what do you do for a living? You work with people. You don't work with them online to photograph them. There are some little exceptions to people doing that, but basically the interpersonal skills is what made my business. Um, am I the best photographer in the world? No, I'm pretty good. I, I know I'm pretty good at this, but people like dealing with me because I make them feel at ease. I make them comfortable. I, give, I make it about them. It's not about me. It's about them. Um, I talk with them. If you couldn't tell, I'm a talker. I'm the king of yak yak. I will keep engaging with people the whole time I'm there because I want to know. Want to know about their kids. I want to know about what they do. I don't want. I don't want to sit there and say, "Oh yeah, you're going to love these images." I'm an award-winning photographer. I have my prints hanging all over the world. I got my master's of photography degree. They could really care less when I'm doing their photograph. But when I'm asking about their children, so wait a minute. You, Jim, what do you what do you do for a living? Oh, that's interesting. You're you know, retired Air Force. Don't have any family in the Air Force, but tell me a little bit more about it. Why am I asking that? I'm, number one, I am interested in people because it makes them more at ease for what I'm doing. Now let's take that to the education level. 
I can sit here and watch, you know, people are sitting here and watching me right now. You're going to get a whole lot out of me if you're sitting with me in person more than you're seeing me online. Um, you know, I can give you a lot of information, but I, I don't know. The only person I can see right now is Roman. So I don't know if people are sitting there going, God, look at him. <laughs> he's still in photography. He's old. What could he possibly know? Or he's not giving me any useful information. What can I learn? How come he hasn't told me how to light or how to pose? Well, those are all skills I learned a long time ago at live classes. I learned from people on how to deal with turning the body. Um, I, I learned with how to, how to place the lighting so that it, it enhances the people. I learned all those things. And those are things we all have to know. But when you're working with people, it's about people. The, the, reason they, they, the reason I charge the prices I do is because I know what I'm doing. I can do it every time. There is no... Can I get the shot? Um, I don't work with contracts with my portrait clients because I feel it's a little bit adversarial. It, it puts them into a different frame of mind. Um, I see a lot of things now on Facebook and the social media during this COVID. How do, how do I put that into my contract? And I'm trying to figure out why it bothers me so much that everything has to be in a contract. And I know we're a litigious world and everything like that. But I'd rather do everything on a handshake. I'd rather, if, if it rains tomorrow, does a contract tell me I can cancel my appointment and they're not going to ask for my session to be back? Because if it rains tomorrow, I'm going to call my client and say, hey, when do you want to reschedule it for? I want to do the best I can for you, and this weather isn't going to allow me to do it. Doing all these things live, learning live, you learn all these little things on, on how things work. You know, I could, I could go, you know, is the light better this way or is the light better this way? And you could see it all right here. You're around people experiencing it and doing it yourself. You know, I'll challenge you to, to if, if somebody were to come right here with me and I work one-on-one -on -one showing you lighting and posing, it's going to be a whole lot different than if you watch me do it on YouTube. And the reason is because I'm going to make you do it. I'm going to show you how to do it. We're going to, I'm going to explain to you why I do it that way. And you're going to ask me a question. Um, I see some questions popping up on the board every once in a while. But um, you can ask me a lot more if you find me in the bar or you find me at a, at a convention. The live learning is where everything is at. I can go on YouTube. I hung gutters yesterday. I put up gutters. So now I, I'm obviously, I went on YouTube. I watched it on how to, how to do it. I read the instructions and I hung gutters, right? Does that make me professional? Does that make me really know what I'm doing? I have the gutters up, the water runs downhill. Not the prettiest job I could possibly do. I could do it better next time. But if somebody was here with me showing me how to do it, I wouldn't have had the little connectors looking all bent up because they had told me how to do it without, you know, using the rubber mallet instead of the hammer. And it's also interacting with the people who are learning with you, right? And throwing ideas off. And you see that bit because you never take in everything the first time around, right? So it's, it's right. that conversation and learning with others that also helps too. And surrounding yourself with the people you want to be like, that you want to, if, if you know a photographer you want to study with, make him, him, make him or her your friend. You can, you can learn a whole lot like that. If you want a good business, surround yourself with friends that they don't all have to be photographers. Photographers don't make the most money in the world. We've seen the stats. My best friends here, I went to high school with my best friends. One's a carpentry contractor that runs his own company. One's an underground utility contractor slash racetrack owner slash farmer who has worked his way through everything and made lots of money in his life and done it all because he worked hard and he learned from his mentors. And the other one's a public administrator. We're four best friends. Tell us, you know, how, how do we compare business? Well, we talk business because it's, same thing, it's about how you deal with people, who you surround yourself with. It's really kind of, that's how the world works. So are you glad you made the decision to be a photographer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I learned how to make a living at it from my parents. I purchased an established business, so I really don't have, uh, I never had the experience of starting from scratch in the business like a lot of people do. I have reinvented myself many times in the type of business we run and the type of location we're at. Um, but I, I, I don't regret a day of doing this because I've had the life I want to have. 
I could have gone into other businesses and maybe made more money. I could have gone into other businesses and got to where I had a retirement at the end that would have been different, but I would have never had the life I had along the way, taking my kids on vacations or uh, just meeting the people I did. Like, you know, how would I have ever met you if I wasn't a photographer? You know, would we have crossed, maybe we would have crossed paths as CEOs of some hedge fund or something. <laughs> you, yeah. you know, you never know how things can change. Oh, and people that love what they do seem to find a way to meet other people in their profession. But it's been, it's been a great career and it's been a great legacy to my family, really to keep doing it like this and to do what I like to do and make, uh, to, to be known as the photographer for all these years in my town. It, there's, I, I'll have to admit, there's a little bit of ego boosting when they say, oh, there's Bert, he's the photographer in town. Kind of cool that they know what I am and that I've been here a long time and that I've been able to live and support my family on it, <laughs> which is very important. So you mentioned earlier that you were president of PPA. So just talk to me about, because there, there's viewers here that are in the UK and might know who PPA are and what that means. Can you, can you just let us just explain to people what president of PPA is and how you become president of PPA? Oh, well, I'm from Chicago, so I paid somebody off. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, PPA, for, for those of you that don't know, it is our member association in the United States. It's, it's over 30,000 professional photographers. It's a membership, open membership association that offers education, uh, different programs and benefits to, to the members. Um, I was president in 1998, which was seems like a long time ago now. I was very, I was young then. My hair was a different color. Um, and it's been around for 120 years. 100, they keep changing the history because they find out that we're older than we are. Well, we used to think it was started in 1880, but now I think it's back down to 1857 or something. Um, and I, was, I got involved with PPA and all that through my parents, of course. My dad was a counselor, which is part of the governing body of PPA. And I got on committees when I finished being president in Illinois, which I was still young because, again, a head start because I was in the family business. I was asked by one of the members of the board of directors if I would help, help him on the convention committee. I said, sure. How hard can that be? Well, when I got to Anaheim, California, he was the convention chairman and he was gonna be in board meetings for the five days. And so he said, you're in charge. So all of a sudden, if you've ever been to an Imaging USA, it wasn't as large then, it was about maybe three or 4,000 people instead of 10,000 or more. Um, I was in charge of making sure the programs ran on time, getting the props, getting the models and all this. And I was just a kid. And, uh, but it, it was kind of, Education by fire, as they say, learn to do it. And that's kind of, I've always been pretty good at being able to stay on my feet and keep dancing and make things work. Um, so I got very involved. I started meeting people in the industry. Every past president from the seventies until now I've been involved with that I've learned from, I've worked for, I've worked with. So I've had great mentors along the way. Uh, and I just worked my way up through the committees. I started on the convention committee, got involved with the portrait group, got to know more people. Got to, I was not, I was, I was the second youngest president ever from PPA. I would have been the youngest, but I didn't get elected the first three times I was nominated. So I, I, I got nominated on a nominating committee, which was a great honor as a young man, but there were many other people that felt that I was too young. I've heard that a lot in my life, not most recently, but when I was younger, a lot, which has also made me a strong advocate for the younger people. I'm a very strong advocate for these millennials that don't do anything and don't know anything. I'm a big fan of theirs because they really do a lot. Um, my generation doesn't understand all of them a whole lot, but um, they're our future, so we got to believe in them, right? So anyway, I got involved, worked my way up through the, the offices, and it's been, a, it's been a great run. It's been a great experience to be involved. I've stayed active. As a past president, I just didn't go away. I've been asked to come back on committees over the years. And as of right now, I still serve for PPA on the World Photographic Cup Committee. That's the last one I'm on right now. Hopefully, I'll get a break from that too and I can go visit my granddaughter more often. 
But, I, you know, I, I feel if you stay involved, you, you, it keeps you knowing what's going on, especially being that I still run a studio. I still want to stay active. I'm not that old for being around that long. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. It makes perfect I'm sense. Old, I'm old, but I got a whole lot of experience in these years, too. <laughs> so, so you've just mentioned something that I really know very little about. And I only heard of it two years ago, I think, was, which is the Photography World Cup. So... Yes. Can you, some of the audience may be a bit like me in, in that way, in that what is the Photography World Cup? And is it actually like, you know, the Soccer World Cup where teams play off against each other and stuff like that? It's, it's kind of it's like if you take the World Cup and the Olympics and put them together. What it is, um, last year we had, I think, 37 countries participate. It was started, I remember talking about it 20 years ago in in Italy at a convention I was at, Norvieto, Italy with their group. And about, I think this is our, going to be our eighth edition next year. Um, PPA, FEP, which is the Federation of European Photographers, the Union of Asian Professional Photographers, the Australian Photographers, the four, those four groups kind of got together and, and created the concept. And since then, other associations have, have joined in to help out. What it is, it's a team competition, country against country, to create a camaraderie, a sharing of ideas and things like that. Um, and there's a point system, there's six categories. There's, didn't know you're gonna ask me about this, so I'm gonna do this by memory if I can. There's commercial, illustrative, photojournalism, which is reportage, portrait, wedding, and I'm forgetting one, or oh, nature and wildlife. So those are the six categories. Um, each country can have three entries in each of the categories. So you have 18 images that are, that are juried within their own countries to send on to this competition. A team captain comes up with the system or the process of selecting the team. No one photographer can be, have more than one image in a category. So in other words, at the most, if you're a really good photographer or a small country, whatever you want to call it, you might have one photographer in all six categories or two or three categories, but, or you can have 18 different photographers with 18 different images. So they compete in a blind judging. Each country that participates is entitled to appoint a judge, which cannot be the team captain to be a, a judge in the competition and you cannot score your own country, country's images. Mm. So the images are taken in advance then of the World Cup, is it? Or do, do all the photographers go to a venue like the Olympics to... Not all photographers go. It's actually, a, it's the, the judging is done online. Okay, and they, you come up with the, and they, they award first, second, and third place are gold, silver, and bronze medalist, which is kind of like the Olympic thing or the World Championships thing. The team with the, that accumulates the most points and... Anybody that, any image that scores in the top 10 in any category, it's points from 10 points for first place down to one point for 10th place. Those points are tallied up and the team with the most points gets the World Photographic Cup, which has been, uh, the United States won the first couple, Portugal has won, Australia, uh, it's, it's been going back and forth, um, some of those countries. So it's been, it's been really interesting. Mexico didn't have a team three years ago and has been in the medals the last couple of years. Russia has a strong team. There's teams from all over Europe. South America has just started entering. Um, and once a year, we host a, a ceremony, which um, last, well, last year we didn't have one. It was supposed to be in Rome. It's been rescheduled to Rome again in 2021, in April of 2021. Um, We'll have it there. And then the following year, it'll be in Mexico City. Mexico will be hosting it. I've been able to go to Sydney, Australia, and, and uh, not, not in Japan. I'm trying, I can't remember the name of the city. Yokohama. And I know Ireland, two years ago, I think, hosted the announcement of the top 10 awards at one of their things. But we, we try to have the event coincide with a country's event. So in other words, the one in Italy will coincide with the Italian Association hosting it. 
last one we had was in Norway and the Norwegian Association hosted us during their convention. So it's, it's brought a lot of people together. The, the, the really the, the most fun part about it, being on the organizing committee, I've got to meet people from all over, which has been great. But watching the medalists that come to the ceremonies become friends with uh, a couple of years ago, Team USA was in Australia and we won the, the cup. And we had five people there, which was unbelievable that we had five that were in the medalist thing, but it was a great year for us. But watching those people become friends with the Finns and the Irish and the Australians and the Chinese and the Russians and everything. It kind of takes down a lot of world barriers that otherwise we might have and they become friends and now they communicate. Uh, either they see each other once a year at the different events or they will communicate online and things like this and they'll share ideas with each other. It's just been a great way to see different styles of photography. Every region has a different style. And within Europe, there's tons of styles. And you know, you, you can almost tell a US entry by the way we present things, or you can tell a Portuguese entry by the way it flows, or the Italians with their romance. Uh, the Irish, there's usually a beer in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> but it's, it's been another, another opportunity for me to really enhance my career. And the other thing I do you know, people say, why well, get go to conventions? I do a lot of the things I do for the press opportunities. I enter a print competition now so that I can put a press release out to my clients that tell them how well I did so that they think I'm great and they want to come and be customers of mine. That's, that's FedEx at my door. Hopefully he's just going to leave it there. <laughs> just that's all right. Hold on a minute. That's okay. <laughs> I knew that would happen during this broadcast. When you, before we started, you pulled all the curtains in the studio because you said there'd be people walking by waving in and <laughs> we didn't plan on FedEx. FedEx was here with a delivery wanting me to probably sign for it. We're good now. <laughs> but um, I, what was I at about? Oh, just You were talking about press releases and press why you release. Gosh, you know, do you guys, is anybody using that? I mean, you got to think about, if you want to stay in photography, I, I've run charities. I think you knew I ran charities and things like that. And I don't need to go on and on. But if I want to be charitable, I need to make more money. If I want to make more money, I got to tell people how good I am. If I don't tell people how good I am, who else is going to? Well, will you come over here, Ronan, and tell everybody? Absolutely, if you'll hire me. <laughs> 3 XM. I mean, um, let me interview you for a minute. For, for all, what's the best advertising that you get for what you do with the 3 XM Think Tank for the Business Academy? It's people telling everybody, you've got to try out 3 XM. You've got to watch these things, these broadcasts and things like that. You know, we need to tell people what we can do for them. Absolutely. So is that is that a way to get the younger people involved as well to say, look, if you're serious about turning your passion for photography into a business that you've got to um, market yourself. And one of those ways is to enter print competitions so you can shout on social media and in your locality and in, in, in hopefully in your newspapers, if they still exist in a few years time, that you, know, that you are the photographer in your area. Put it on Facebook, tell people about it. I mean, I don't know about, I know the Americans here, we're very, we do the print awards and they're all telling about, you know, I got these awards. They're all bragging about the awards I got. I can tell all the other photographers in the world how many awards I got and that they could say, oh, good job, you know, and we're going to give you this other award. But I want my clients to be the ones that think it's a cool idea. They love the fact that they're, they're and this is the best part, when I'm, I'm their photographer. I'm not a photographer, I'm their photographer. When they say, my photographer is Burton, he won all these awards. My photographer is Burton, he was interviewed by Ronan from Ireland to go on a broadcast all across the world. This is a big deal. Tell people about it. I mean, put it out on your, on your blog, on your Facebook, Instagram. Send it, to your, uh, send it to your local media. I don't know what it's called, all over in, 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 maybe it's called the same thing. I belong to my local chamber of commerce. Do you have chamber of commerce by there? Yes. It's called that. I'm the president this year. 
I was looking forward to having all these ribbon cuttings and being out there and getting all the press this year. Well, that changed a little bit. Now we're all stuck inside. But the opportunities that I get by being involved with my local business group, if it's a, if it's a business networking group, if it's a civic group like the Kiwanis, Alliance Club, Rotary, things like that, there's all kinds of opportunities that afford you and those are all press relatable pieces of information. When, my, when Cindy and I do programs, when I talk about marketing, one of the things I say in there all the time is, uh, I'm, I'm a, <laughs> excuse the language for a minute, but I'm a publicity whore. I will do almost anything for, for the opportunity for somebody to talk about me. Um, I like all publicity except for indictments and death notices. Those are the only two I don't like. And the thing is, if you don't blow your own horn, who will? Don't be afraid to tell people that you've done good things. Um, leverage it to your, your advantage so that you can keep doing good things. You know, I don't, I don't tell people I'm doing good things so that people think I'm great. I tell them because I want them to know I'm doing good things because that's, what, that's how I am. That's, that's what I do. I want to be really good at what I do. I want to be very generous and to, with people and time and things like that. And I want people to do the same. I want them to pay it forward. I, I, if, if all you do is take, you're probably not. That's why I'm on here with you. Because <laughs> you're, you're not a taker. Yeah, I mean, you're, you, you share. You want, you, you, the rising tide lifts everybody up type thing. Absolutely. So, Bert, you've been all over the world, you know. Yeah, and unfortunate, yes. President, and involvement in the World Cup and stuff. And you mentioned that you can see a difference in style. But if we can go back to the business challenges and the business opportunities that you've seen, do they differ in the different countries you see or are the opportunities and challenges similar? I think they're different. I, you know, I'm an expert, not at all. I think, you know, I, I mean, it, when I first got started traveling internationally, it, it seemed like in the European area that to become a photographer, you had to be, you had to go through an apprenticeship of some sort. You couldn't just hang a shingle out like we do here. Here, if you have a camera and somebody tells you they do nice pictures, they become photographers. Not all of them are that way, but, but a lot of them do. And that's, that's fine. You know, I can become a plumber too if I don't want to be licensed. I can tell people I do plumbing. Um, but everybody does different. So I, I guess in the business area, it seemed to me that has, have things changed in Ireland too? Or is there a, a government process that you have to be licensed to be a photographer or not? No, no, no. No, and you know, I, I used to, years ago, I thought it was a good idea. And I had people tell me that it's a horrible idea. To this day, they will still, the masses will tell you it's a bad idea, but without any regulations or credentialing, how do you know if anybody's any good? You know, how, how do you know if you're a photographer of people that that person is number one, gonna be safe with you? Do they have some kind of weird thing in their head of why they're photographing? I mean, oh, you're pretty, I should photograph you. That's like something that, I don't ever wanna be known as the creepy guy. Um, can I do the job for you? Will I show up at the job and not know how to handle the light or the people? I mean, so if there was more credentialing, I think it would help the industry. Um, would there be less photographers? Probably because just like everything else, if they can't figure it out, they won't make it. As far as business, and I, and, I, and I did what I do, I went somewhere else. But as far as business practices, uh, most of my experiences with, was with Italy. I, I, I've been to Italy like 13 times. I've done programs there about eight or 10 times to photographers. They tell me that they don't do family portraits there. The biggest thing, very much, whatever. The biggest thing I do is family portraits. If there's you can see over my, you know, the four people at the beach over here, those are six or seven people at the park down the street. Most of my business and most of my income is derived from photographing families. Now, when I would go over there and talk to them about it, the older people would argue that we don't do families and they, there would be everything from during World War II, when they capture the images of people, they were doing it to keep track of people. So we didn't want to know people 
that were together. And I would be like, huh, never, I never experienced that here for an issue or passport pictures were the big thing. I was in Venezuela one year and there was a most successful studio in Venezuela brought me down to do programs down there. And their biggest, I think the biggest part of their business was passport photos. They were in a mall. I, if I recall, I want to say they did 20 or 30,000 passports in a year. Boy, if I did six, that was it. But, and, and they also had, you know, different individual pictures and some family pictures and stuff like that. But that was the biggest driving thing was the photo finishing and the passport business that those studios would take in. Whereas with me, we don't take in photo finishing. We don't do passports. We're, we're strictly a portrait studio. We do a little bit of weddings for our clients, but we concentrate just on that. Uh, the European, the Australian model seems to be similar to what I have here. Ireland and most of that part seem to be kind of similar in the sales and the photography end of it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I see them doing projection selling. I see them showing products. Um, do you know anything about products in photography? Absolutely nothing. How would I know? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Joking aside. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but all the all the different things that that uh, that we do, and I, I don't know that I have a. You know, I'm trying to come up with an answer and try to sound real profound, which I'm not. I yeah, just no, I, I'm just curious because uh, you know you've seen so many different countries and, and 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 what goes on, and you know I see nuances of difference in the countries I visited, and I've only visited a fraction of, of the countries you've been in. But yeah, so, for example, in in Europe. We certainly don't have this the high school senior um, culture, right. we, and and I think we miss that because I think a lot of photographers in the U.S. You know that's a big part of the photography business. What I see is that is that right or is that just no? Some... That's that's absolutely right. Now, like everything else, that business is changing too. Um, my wife and I about three years ago decided we would do high school senior photography. Now, keep in mind, we're a, we're a business that does about 100 jobs a year. That's it. We don't do a large volume. The local high schools in our district here have about 3,000 high school seniors. So there's a lot of business out there for it. Um, I hear from some of them that they're seeing their sales start to come down. But what's happening is I see groups of young women walking by, high school girls, walking by my studio. They'll stop and look at my pictures, and they'll go around the corner where a lot of the local photographers will take high school seniors and do their own pictures. So there's a whole bunch of shifting in all photography going on like that. But, but that being said, parents still want them to get their high school picture taken. It, they have to be, here we're a contract state, so they have to be photographed for the yearbook that they get every year. Um, our business thrives on milestones. Milestone photography, it's, newborn you know it, we run in a circle we get them when they're babies we try to get them a couple times maybe when they're 10 years old it's a special portrait and then maybe it's their communion the the, the religious milestones confirmation bar mitzvahs quinceaneras for the hispanic people and all of a sudden the high school seniors and what do they do after that then they get engaged we do engagement pictures you see that circle going around then we do the wedding maybe and then after the wedding, what happens? They have a start of their own family. And then that's when we do the baby pictures and, you know, it moves around. So all those, we, we advocate for the milestones, which I think I see in a lot of the other countries too. It's weddings and it's, uh, do, do they do communion and confirmation type pictures in Ireland? Yes. That would be similar in Italy. In, that day. in Italy, unlike in Ireland, we don't hire a professional photographer for baptism and okay. confirmation. But in Italy, they do. They hire a professional photographer for yeah. those yeah. Yeah. And for a baptism, which, and that's different because I can't tell you the last time I did a christening or baptism type thing, but, but they will do a, a, a communion, which is what, about eight years old or something like that. Yes. It's a rosary and a prayer book or a bar mitzvah when they're 13 or, you know, all the, all the different milestone events. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the card companies make something up. You know, you want for, Valentine's Day is a good one. Valentine's Day for the lovers, you know, the couples to do something like that. We need to come up with St. Patrick's Day a little bit, you know. 
Yeah, you see, the problem is we all drink too much beer, so does the photographer, so the quality of the photography mightn't be too good. But would but, but you remind me of when you came to Ireland? So you were over on, on a trip with photographers yeah. um, with, with the Homans, and we met up then. So just tell me, what did you like most about Ireland? The people. The people. So not, not the green fields. <laughs> I love the green fields. I love the landscape. I love the beer and I love the whiskey. And I love, but it's just kind of what I am. It's the people. I've been two places in my life that the people have just impressed me so much. One was Ireland. The other one was in the Philippines. And, you know, two, two completely different cultures, two completely different sides of the world. But there was just a, a, a friendliness about Ireland that there were no strangers in Ireland. They were they're like you. They smile, they talk to you, you're engaged, um, and they give you the time of day. That's really what I like. Now, you want to go with the landscape? Yeah. I mean, you've got a beautiful landscape. You got these sheep that are running. My wife sees a sheep and she wants to run after them and take pictures of everything while we're there. Um, so yeah, well, you mentioned we're with the Homans. You know, we try to do that once a year. We go somewhere different. Last year we were in Italy, year before that in Ireland. Next year we're going to Scotland. Well, this year was supposed to be Scotland, but something happened. Um, and and the, the other thing that, you know, if, if, if you've never traveled internationally, and both of us have, obviously, I think I was about, I was in my 40s already, the first time I went somewhere beside Mexico or Canada, got out of North America, and it was eye-opening, just to see the rest of the world, to see the similarities you have, but then to see the differences and how they, how beautiful they are, how well they, they work together. The, my Italian friends, I learned that when they're yelling and screaming at each other, they really do like each other. <laughs> they're just very passionate. <laughs> when the Irish are smiling, they're not always happy, but they're always smiling, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. When you see our weather and you see how many gray skies we have and the rain we have, it's a wonder we smile at all. It must be the Guinness. I'm convinced it must be the Guinness of the Irish whiskey. I'm from Chicago, and people want to know how I can stay here in the winter. And it's because I love, I love where I'm at. I love the people, and I love. There's just it's comfortable. But yeah. So tell me this. So if if I was to put a crystal ball in front of you, uh -oh. where do you see the photography industry going in the next ten years? You know, it's, it's, it's as different as it seems. It's not much different than it was 50 years ago, really. It's just, it's more plentiful. The delivery is much different. A lot of it is not printed anymore. A lot of it is digital. Um, I hope there's always going to be those that print it, print things because that's the true archivalness of it. But I'm seeing less people doing that. It's, it seems like if they're printing things, it's more on products. Beside boxes and matted things like that, you know, it could be on a t-shirt, could be on a mug. I mean, you know, you, you think about it and, and as a portrait photographer, I want them to have that large portrait on the wall and value it. But as a grandparent, that little mug that was given to me with my granddaughter's picture on it has as much value as a lot of other things I have. So I see, I see the delivery being, I think digital is just going to keep growing it. You know, it's, it's prof professionalism. Will it ever come back? Yeah, I, I already see it coming back to a certain extent. 10 years down the road, will it shift again? It could. Um, is, is what's happening in the world now with this COVID the worst I've ever seen in the photography business? It's actually not. Worst I ever saw, and it was the early 80s during the financial crisis and the high interest rates when people couldn't afford anything because money was so expensive. At least people come back out and appreciate. I'd, I'd like to deep dive into that a little bit with you because a lot of people have said to me they've never seen anything like this and we haven't from a health point of view and stuff. Yeah. It's interesting. So with regards to the interest in photography, you've seen it worse in the 80s in the financial crisis. Oh, comparatively from where it was to where it went, I thought, I thought it was, yeah. I remember my folks, I remember from going to having a very successful business to being very scared that they could raise their family. Now, is that happening actually now? Absolutely. I'm, I'm sure it's happening now. 
and maybe it's because of my age and being more prepared for it and not and knowing that I didn't have to count on it to stay like it was to, to survive. And I, but I think that's, the, it's, it's all about preparing yourself for just about anything, but at least people are still doing it. Yes, we could not go outside, but you know what? Back then we didn't go to dinner as often as we do now. We didn't go see entertainment as often as we did now. Uh, there wasn't a concert coming to town every day in Chicago back then. A couple times a month, a big band would come through town, you'd know about it, and you'd try to go to shows, or the movies would come out, there weren't as many movies, there weren't as many distractions. So when, when, when everything fell apart back then, uh, it was really tough, it was tough, and, and uh, the construction industry dried up, and that was the, ba that was the bread and butter for my parents' studio. These people that were in construction are what were our customers. We weren't the, the big high tooting uh, stockbrokers or something like that. And we're still kind of like that. We're the more the tradespeople, but there are more people that own the company than that work in there are our customers. And as much as, uh, and, and I, I think I'm more optimistic than a lot of people do right now because something good is going to come out of this. A lot of good is going to come out of this. Somebody asked me, oh, what's it been like being quarantined for all those times? And I said, I've been having a ball. And they're like, what? <laughs> Well, I get to spend time with my wife. The kids don't live in state, but we have one of those portals and we can talk to our granddaughter four times a day or our kids. I can interact with people on the streets. The streets got quiet, but the people that were out there, I could have conversations with if we didn't want to infect each other. Um, it's been kind of peaceful a little bit for me, which is so ironic in the midst of all this, if you're following everything in the world, you know, with the pandemic, there's people that are dying. There's tons of people that are dying. There's people, we're, we're saying there's not as many people dying now and the percentage is going down, but people are still getting sick. You know, just because you don't die doesn't mean it's not bad. It's impacting their family businesses. It's, it's I know it's bad, but I think the governments, whether you like them or not, whatever, have done a pretty good job of keeping things going. There's my wife and she won't walk in because she's walking the dog. <laughs> Otherwise I'd introduce you. Um, and it's just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full guy. I, I see positive things coming out of this. I think the initial spin for photography, going taking it back to photography, I think we're going to see a big uptick. I think people are going to realize how important these things are to them to be together. You know, if they haven't killed their kids yet from being at home or their spouse, will there be a baby boom or a divorce boom? We don't know. There could be both. Um, but I think people are starting to value some of the things that they forgot about. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I'm seeing it in a couple of different places where, you know, you can just, you can see it everywhere. You can see it in, in even buying habits that are starting to happen now and, and, and if you do social listening which we do as an organization i think you're right i think people were on a they were on this merry-go-round of a rat race you know and and what's happened is is really really sad and is really challenging for so many people but i think out of it it's it's got people to rethink about what's really important well i my, my business i'm in the middle of downtown of my little town here. It's not, a, we're a town of 20,000 people. But I'm in, I have, I have the best location I've ever had in a studio in the 60 some years of our existence of a studio. Um, because next, uh, I'm pointing toward it, it's right there. Right next to me is an Italian restaurant. It's part of a, a chain of restaurants, a smaller chain in Chicago. And it's called Francesca's. It's the busiest Francesca's, including the ones in Chicago, in his whole chain. Next to that is a Mexican restaurant, which is also the same owner. It's busier than the Italian one. And next to that is a barbecue American style type place. I'm um, next to three restaurants and they all walk this way. They put street dining out there now to help them. The government, you know, the local government's trying to help them out by giving them capacity. But what's happened is as they've opened up their carryout business, which for a while, all we could do is carry out business. And they were so busy. They were so good. They had masks. They had gloves. 
the trunks would open up, they put the food in, the trunks would close, the people would drive off. I thought they were drug dealers, the way they were doing business over here. Um, now that they've kind of opened up again, they've kind of gotten busy inside again a little bit, but I still see all the carryout stuff happening. And I've talked to some people because I talk to everybody. My wife will tell you, I talk to everybody. They're having fun. They're spending more time at home eating together. Parents still don't like to cook as much as they used to, but they are cooking a lot more. But when they're not cooking, instead of going out to dinner, they're doing carry out and having dinner at home together. So they've already changed their family habits. And by spending more time together as a family portrait photographer, I want to capture the, the feeling that they want to be together. So that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm going. I think, it, I think it's going to have a large uptick. I think it's going to be a while because this stuff's real and it's hurting a lot of people, but I'm, I'm encouraged. People want, people are finding out that there's other things besides working all the time. They can work from home. And if they work from home, that means I can have sessions during the week instead of waiting till they're off on the weekend. So what you're saying to me, I think, is that my youngest daughter is 18 today. So it's the first time in our household that my four children are adults <laughs> legally. Wow, congratulations. Happy birthday. Yeah, so we're, we're going to celebrate that now in a short while. But um, so if, if my daughter, Mirren, came to me and said, Dad, I want to be a photographer, you think I should encourage that if that's what she wants to do? I think you should encourage your children to be whatever it is they want to be. Um, is it a tough business? Yes. It's a tough business. It's a great second business for a family. Being that this is the only way we make our money, we, we work really hard at staying at the top of it and getting the education and doing the things and, and realizing it's a business. And when you have to do that, and this is, I don't have, we don't have the luxury of health insurance from somebody else and somebody else paying for my business trips and all that stuff. You know, it's, it's all on us, but you know what? I wouldn't trade it. It's if you, if you love what you do, you know, if you're, if you're a carpenter and that's what you love to do, do it. If you own a dress shop and that's what you love to do, you might not get rich on it, but, but do it. But then again, you know, that dress shop could turn into Ralph Lauren and be a big company. You know, a photography studio, you know, if somebody wanted to, fran they've been franchises before. And what happens when photography studios grow big, what happens is all of us small businesses band together to try to figure out how to take business from them. You know, don't be afraid of other people coming into your market and trying to, and they will take business from you, but it'll make you figure out how to take it back or don't let them take it. Be a better business person, be a better photographer, be a better person in general. Uh, you've told us all the way, uh, all along about connecting with your community, you know, be, be recognized in your community as the photographer and the person who captures those really special moments of family and new arrivals into the family with newborn and weddings and all that process, those life events that people will, I believe, I think you're absolutely right, will respect more and want to reflect more in photography as a result of what we're going through. Let them, let them know who you are. Be part of the community. Be part of the people. I mean, if you think Facebook and, and a blog and your website is going to drive all your business, those are just tools to enhance your business. You drive your business. Absolutely. I'm just putting on my glass to see if there's any questions. If anyone has any questions, ask the them. One will be, can you tell them to shut up? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't had that. And I have a question. Sandra wants to know, Bert, do you mentor photographers? Every day, officially and unofficially. Okay, so if, if Sandra wants or someone else wants to make contact with you, how do they go, go about that? Email me. You can do all the other things. You can Facebook message me. You can try to Instagram me. <laughs> My son still makes fun of me. I opened an Instagram account, had 600 followers in the first few months and had one post. <laughs> I'm not a big Instagrammer, but people know who I am through PPA stuff. Um, email. And my email is Bert, it's my name. Can you put it in a link or something? Yeah, I can type it in here. Let me do a few now. And bankyphoto.com, B-E-H-N-K-E photo, P-H-O-T-O.com is my website. Hit me up through the contact page, email me. I'm all over Facebook. I run different events. You'll find me somewhere. So all they have to do is Google and they'll find you, right? 
you, if you Google Bert Banky, it'll be me or some doctor from Germany that'll come up. <laughs> very good, very good. Bert, listen, thank you so much for joining us today. I think it's... you misspelled the last name in that thing, though. Did I? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I just saw the message. I think you had... See, I did. I took off my glasses. I should never take the H and the N mixed up. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's it's on the screen there, though. The bank. Uh, okay, give it to me again. Uh, Bert B E R T at yeah. Banky B E H N K E photo dot com. Photo. 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 P H O T O. Photo dot com. Okay. So let me read it back to you and sure I got it right. So it's Bert at uh, B E H N K E photo dot com. Yeah, and I've been, you know, I've been around to a lot of different places. And if you need to find me, somebody will find me. As you said, Google it, and you'll either find yourself or a doctor in Germany. So they'll be able to work out. <laughs> and I'm not the doctor. I'm not, I'm not that important. <laughs> Bert, listen, thank you so much for joining us in the Think Tank. I know a lot of people will learn so much and take inspiration from you because a lot of photography businesses are going through these difficult times. But I think you're absolutely right. There'll be an opportunity there. Use the time to make the connections in your community. And, um, you know, if you're a younger photographer, come to Imaging USA and, and the other regional shows because it's interacting with people that will really make a difference. So please and, and, love to yeah, see introduce you. yourself. Introduce yourself to all of us. Don't be afraid to come up and talk to us. I'm very approachable. Absolutely. And, and that's true of our industry because uh, a lot of people are, oh, I can't talk. There's Bert. I can't talk to Bert. Say hello. Um, I've never, ever said hello to anybody in our industry where I haven't had a smile back and a, and a wonderful conversation. So do, don't be afraid to interact and say hello. And thank you for having me, Ronan, and thank you for all you do for the industry. And I look forward to being there when you get your award at Imaging USA this year. Thank you, Bert. Um, I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's true honor, totally unexpected. Um, but um, what can you say? But, but thank you to... Somebody had to nominate me somewhere and people had to vote on it. So you know how that works better than I do. But then but we, I tried mean, to keep, we tried to keep you out, but you smiled too much. So we had to <laughs> Bert, thank you so much. Give, give our love to Cindy. And I love you, to Susan. Take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. And we'll see you very soon on the Think Tank. Bye for now. Okay.